Uh, you ready, Mr. Briscoe? I'm ready, brother. Welcome to Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I will be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got a treat today. I've been looking forward to this ever since Mr. Briscoe told me that we got Dr. Mike Lano on the show today. He is a wrestling historian. He was a dentist to the stars, talking about Abdullah, Mick Foley, you name it, the Sheik, the fireball throwing Sheik, not like uh, Dr. Isaac Yankum, who later became a monster, the re a real dentist, but he's also photographed all of the stars from, he just told me he had pictures of Eddie Guerrero as a baby. He is Mr. Do Dr. Mike Lano. Doc, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Jerry Briscoe, one of the world's great NWA World Junior Heavyweight Champions after Danny Hodge had that car accident. A lot of people don't know you know, they think of Jerry as a tag wrestler, but Jerry, incredible. The only brother combination to hold the world heavyweight and the world junior, would be obviously Jerry and Jack, uh, along with the guys, you know, the, the peers of, of Jerry holding that junior world championship. Kenny Mantel, uh, so many greats. Hiro Matsuda, obviously. And you, JBL, not just the wrestling god, but the global fiscal guru. <laughs> Wow. Oh, wow. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, Mike, you want to take over the show? You're doing great. I, he, <laughs> he's doing a wonderful job so far. We should just yeah. let him. Hey, I'll bring hey, him hey, hey, Mike, don't forget, Mike, we, Gerald Briscoe not only had that great run as a singles wrestler, then as a tag team wrestler, then as part of the Stooge faction in the late 90s, where they drew. My, where I they got drew to see him rate. work. I mean, Jack came into my, we're talking Los Angeles territory, which was my home base, my two home base territories, shooting for the program. I was like the only guy with the balls to go backstage in the locker room at the Olympic Auditorium in LA. You had to go downstairs. And uh, the guy that trained me, who was like the king, a king of uh, wrestling photographers from the 50s and boxing, which we had in that office, uh, Theo Errett was the guy that trained me, but uh, Jack Briscoe coming into the Olympic Auditorium LA for the first time, getting stiffed a little shorter on his pay envelope by promoter Mike LaBelle in 73, the opening match of a card in a tournament, but the opener, where would you see Jack Briscoe, one of the world's greatest pro wrestlers of all time against you know, another God in Terry Funk in the opener, 15 minute Terry, Broadway. Terry Funk and Jack Briscoe were the opener of that card. My goodness, what a pack that card that had to be. And on top, no, because they that was all we were interested. On top was Victor Rivera with the, the fireball thrown cheek, uh, choking him with a towel for 10 minutes. No interest <laughs> in that. My interest is within these pure athletes. And uh, almost everybody, if we're talking Los Angeles as a territory, so my home base shooting for the program was Los Angeles. Also, my secondary home base was Roy Shire, San Francisco. But there's so much to talk about. Well, that's great because, that. John, I'm sure John's going to ask you this question because every West Coast wrestler we have on there, John's going to ask. So I'm not going to spoil John's question, but I know if, if he forgets it, I'll remember it. <laughs> I've already forgot it. It, it, it. It's a question about San Francisco and L.A. Yeah. and talent yeah. exchanges. So I really yeah. kind of gave it away. So that's your I, 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 you really, I, been really, really curious on that. Yeah, but I do got to ask, how did you know Jack got stiffed on his payoff? Oh, he told me. He told me what <laughs> happened with the Sheik when he came in. The only time he he came in, and I heard uh, Jerry does an incredible job. Both of you guys, anytime you, and both of you have gone recently on Busted Open. So I listen every day. I try to shoot Dave LaGreca emails with history, Bully, Bubba, uh, Tommy Dreamer and stuff uh, when things are happening. And even like when they mention a wrestler, boom, I'll pull out one of my photos and send it. But Jerry was talking about uh, Jack not gigging and the Jack did get color, but I think it was hard way uh, just a little. And it made all the covers in the magazines and spreads in Japan when he worked on that Kobo Reno show for the Sheik. So it wasn't any of the pencil or any of that bullshit. Uh, I know you guys were talking though, in terms of Oli and the blood thing and the briscoe brothers were smart enough to just prick their fingers like they're having a diabetes test instead of gigging <laughs> their foreheads which Oli did with a butter knife yeah, that's well, jerry's I... story that's not mine to tell <laughs> okay but and uh, I've, told, and I've told it so it's like the montreal <laughs> deal i've told it you know no move on <laughs> but it was funny that it was such a big deal because everybody knew what a class amateur what a class class uh, I mean, Jack Briscoe, even if you're shooting ringside, you're marking out because it's like Lawrence Olivier or John Wayne is like right in front of you or Tony Bennett or, you know, whomever, Barbara Streisand or some major person. And we had so much respect. In, in, 
those were the traveling world champions, you know, Jack, Kaniski, all these wonderful people. I got to shoot a, a Sam Muchnick wrestling at the Chase TV match, Funk Brothers against Jack Briscoe paired with Gene Kaniski. And I'm marking out for stuff like that. How could you not? You know, you have to love the business. Right. Some of these people today, the wrestlers, they didn't grow up as wrestling fans. I have no respect for. If you grew up or a little kid and you were glued to the set and, uh, you know, Mike, That's Mike, I, Mike, your your passion and your love for the business is, is really coming out on 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 your 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 show there and then, but I want to know where where did you develop that passion? Where did where, where what really turned you on to professional wrestling? You know, as a as a young man and 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 made it made it made it your pursuit after your dentistry work. Uh, no, no, it was way before that. I was watching TV in, in the 60s. We had almost everybody came into Los Angeles, even the lean years, like uh, 66, 67. We had Mark Lewin. Uh, Blassie had taken a bit of time off. Now, Freddie Blassie, that was his home base. He was the greatest heel. I mean, he started very early, like John Tolis, his big Los Angeles nemesis of the Tolis brothers, who Jerry told me that's one of those influential tag teams for the Briscoe brothers. But Blassie, like when he started in the 40s as Sailor Fred Blassman, uh, was on and off in L.A. You know, he had roots in St. Louis, roots in Atlanta. The weirdest Styles Class match I ever took pictures of. My family took me to, uh, we had family in uh, Calhoun, Georgia. Went to the Atlanta City Auditorium for a Christmas show. 73, Blassie against Bill Watts. And Fred, like he did in Honolulu against Billy Robinson, was not selling for the Cowboy. And you could tell Watts was getting really <laughs> pissed off in that main event. And Blassie was the, you know, the baby face. I think most of his life was Southern heavyweight champion. He was a heel in Atlanta territory yeah. area, but yeah. this was a special show. And uh, so El Blassie, it, it, it was seeing guys like Blassie and then uh, Iron Mike DiBiase. How, how did you get in Atlanta from uh, were you on vacation out there for summer? We had or? family. We had family that owned a lot of... Uh, uh, soybean uh, farms in Calhoun and in Atlanta right. proper still have the they still have the mansion there but we would go back every year for Christmas so there was a lot of cool little outlaw promotions in 72 73 74 uh, where I started shooting ringside BS my way in to shoot and then I'd go to the Atlanta City Auditorium this was before the they, they would only have the Omni for the bigger shows like St. Louis right. with the Checker Dome as opposed to Keel right. and uh that, I mean, I was just blown away. In the opening match, seeing Bob Armstrong uh, teaming with, uh, oh, God, I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, just amazing talent. Tim Woods, who was absolutely incredible. Um, and that was my, you know, when I started watching wrestling and seeing all this insanity in L.A., the fireball throwing cheek, and uh, a young Lonnie Maine, who later was the, the very first Moondog, and tough Tony Bourne and guys coming down. A lot of talent trading between like Portland and Vancouver down to filtering down to San Francisco Shires territory and us in LA. And that is when, even before I started working full-time for the magazines, I wanted to, which put me through dental school, I wanted to shoot and experience every territory, every territory, the athletic ones like Eddie Graham, Florida and Munchnick St. Louis, which is you know, one of my favorites of all time it's totally different the the timekeepers the fans the ring announcers i mean we had an la but, uh, well, let me stop you there that the, the st louis one did you uh, like that wrestling at the chase were you there were the days where you know the, the during the dinner chase times where the, they had the people were having dinner and the guys were working I think that was prior to my time. The first time I was there was 75 that was, uh, yeah, for the yeah, Baba that Briscoe that rematch from Japan. Okay. Yeah, but when, then you you too, the chase was Friday night and then Saturday was wrestling at the chase. Um, so there weren't any tables or people eating. I mean, I've heard of all that, but I didn't get to see that firsthand. But I still, I mean, I got to see Sarge, Bob Remus, doing his knockoff of superstar Billy Graham before he worked as a masked superstar destroyer mark four for was Ganya. he beautiful bob then something like that because he had, jesse he ventura was, and him were both doing bob, their right jerry beautiful beautiful bob yeah, yeah Sarge, and he's wearing Sarge, all Sarge, psychedelic yeah, stuff and the reason but, the reason because that was because of uh uh what was it, luscious larry and uh and a handsome harley 
<laughs> well, he wanted to be a beautiful Bob. <laughs> yeah. He was a, a nice guy even then. That we but he wasn't, he wasn't beautiful Bob. Though. No, he wasn't beautiful. Bob. He may have been Bob. <laughs> yeah, he was Bob. But he was wearing he was the tie-dye. But I told him the tie-dye started with superstar Billy Graham in L.A. He was Billy Graham, Wayne Coleman, but superstar Billy Graham. You know, Jerry Graham discovers him in Phoenix. Brings him to L.A. in 1970. Billy Graham with yeah, jet how, black how did, hair. Yeah, how did, how did doc, uh, Dr. Jerry discover uh, Billy and, and Phoenix? Was Billy in the weightlifting or was he in the work? Yeah, at the he was in a gym, like a world or a gold okay. gym right. in, uh, in Phoenix. And then he brings him to L.A. thinks this will be catapult him because uh, And Eddie then is Graham, that when, that's when he started learning how to work? Or had he already? Uh, well, Jerry, who was the shits as a trainer, brought him in, taught him some <laughs> basics. Jules Strongbow, our genius booker promoter, took one look and they had him do TV a couple of times. Billy Graham had jet black hair then. It wasn't dyed or anything. And he said, I'm sending you up to Stu Hart. He sends him up there for a year. And then Stu sends him to Roy Shire. And Billy Graham is working with leather chaps as the spirit of America was his gimmick. He's paired with a heel, Pat Patterson. Shire puts the tag straps on them. And then Billy or Billy turns on Pat turns Pat face, that was a huge deal. But then Billy comes into our territory, March of 1972, Los Angeles, to feud with John Tolis, who just turned baby face. And Billy, it was uh, uh, Jules Strongbow who put him in the tie dye and worked with him as he would several years later, January 76, creating Roddy Piper's hot rod character, the whole thing. Roddy could play bagpipes, but he wasn't wearing a kilt then. So, but with Superstar Graham, March of 1972, uh, you know, was, he, it, was it Garibaldi that put the uh, kilt on on uh, Ty Piper? Yes, he, Roddy Piper in se January '76. He's sent in by Red Bastine, one of the greatest people in the world. I hope Jerry, you were close to Bastine. You know, like Jose Lothario and some of your other pals, Wahoo. Right. Uh, you, you know, you guys, your peers. But Red was sending him to San Francisco, and he said, oh, just do this one shot for L.A. Uh, Mike LaBelle needs somebody for the 22-man Battle Royal. So Roddy comes in. He's in the opening match against Tony Rocco, falsely advertised as Argentina Rocca's nephew. <laughs> but Bastine would work with Gene LaBelle, judo Gene LaBelle, to get Roddy and Tony Rocco, as he would later with the Guerreros and Chris Adams, to New Japan for Inoki. Uh, but but anyway, so uh, he comes in. It's a, a Broadway. Nobody knew who Roddy was. But within six days at the San Diego Coliseum, Leo Garibaldi and Piper spent all of this time, including Gene LaBelle, finessed out this character, decided to make him top heel. Because with Blassie and Tolis gone, Tolis got pissed at being stiffed. Blassie had in the 70, late 71 accepted Vince Sr.'s offer to come move back there because Mike LaBelle had stiffed him. On the very first pro wrestling closed circuit, it happened in my territory, Los Angeles, 1970 Right, I'd, I'd like to get into that and also that, that, that's in conjunction with L.A. Coliseum, right, also. Oh, that led to it. And that broke, that L.A. Coliseum show, August of 1971, broke gate in attendance that uh, previously, Thez had set all those records up and down the state against guys like 1971, so this is how many years before the WrestleMania? What was it? That was supposed well, to be. 84 was WrestleMania, uh, March 30th, was it, of 83, okay. 84? 84, rather. 84, so that's 14 years, 13 years before that. But that also did put the seed in his eye because Mike LaBelle, who was kind of a squirrely, not so well-liked promoter, like a beloved I mean, the, the promoters that were, were loved, Eddie Graham totally respected as a genius. Roy Shire, not the nicest guy, a yeller screamer like Vern Gagne, but he paid You know well, the oxymoron on, on Eddie Graham that I always thought was really weird? Uh, Eddie's one of the most respected promoters in our business, right? Yep. But he was also noted to be one of the worst payoff promoters in, 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 the, in the business, too. And I never understood how those two could really jive and you be a good guy on one hand, and and you know, and a ship payoff play on the other. But everybody I, I, wanted to work. The two places they really wanted to work on the bucket list for the boys, the people I spoke to, was Florida. Eddie Graham, Florida, yeah. Munchnik. Another yeah, ethical yeah, guy yeah, was that, uh, that was that was my bucket list. St. Louis, and then I added Houston as I got a little uh, bit older in the business. So, um, how, how did he pay your brother? 
Great. I mean, yeah, they paid the guys that he needed great, but just like, you know, a lot of these other promoters, if you were working underneath, you didn't really make a lot of money at Florida. You had to be the, the top three or four guys, and he spread it out among the top four, four or five guys, but after that, there was a significant drop-off because I, I pass out those checks a lot. I got my hair <laughs> Uh, uh, bloody lot of time. <laughs> Listen to the, the word coming out of my ear. Well, wasn't the story that uh, like the second biggest cheerleader for Jack Briscoe besides Eddie Graham was Paul Bosch? And I heard that uh, right. Bosch was going to put the bond up for the NWA title on Jack if Eddie didn't. Yeah, yeah. Jack, boy, Paul Bosch. Th- you was heard, you heard the like story on, on 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 the jackpot that I I had to carry to St. Louis for Eddie. Right? He shorted me five grand. He, 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 he quick handed me five grand. I, he called me and he said, you're going to have to take the money for St. Louis. I can't make it. And I was booked there. Jack wasn't booked there. And Eddie was supposed to go with me. And Eddie said, I can't make it. So you're going to have to carry it. Come over to my house and get it. I had $25,000 in cash. I'd never seen $25,000 in cash at that time. So I go, I go over to uh, Eddie's house. He's got a Halliburton suitcase. And that's what everybody carried their, their money in. We counted out $25,000 and $100 bills, put them in the briefcase. I excused myself to go to the bathroom, and we had to come back, had a drink, and then the briefcase was locked up and everything. So I get off, and I don't open this thing up, of course. I'm scared to death. It was, it was back before pre-TSA, so I didn't have to worry about to go to TSA for all, with all that money. But I was still scared to death. That suitcase never left my hand. Got there, Sam picked me up. We go to Sam's office, counted it out. There's twenty thousand dollars or five thousand dollars is missing. Jesus, holy shit! You know, well, who who the last one had the money? Me. So Sam said, "What happened?" I said, "I don't know." So we'll call Eddie. Eddie. Well, when you left here, there were twenty five grand in that suitcase. We both counted it out. I said, "I know, Eddie." And then you packed it in the suitcase when I was I was going to the bathroom. Well, he said, "Let me look around here." And he went and overlooked. There were five grand in between the, his desk and 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 the wall. So, what was I he don't hoping, know what was he ho- hoping much stick would not count it. I don't. I guess so. I don't really know. I mean, uh, you know, I asked him what happened. He said, "Well, I just I did dry, I dropped out of the suitcase somehow." Yeah, sure. <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? No, hell no, I don't believe. That. <laughs> but it, I mean, I was a no. You can imagine a kid that never had. I did have twenty five grand. I had five grand to pay. <laughs> the difference. You know? Look at what next to JPL on his right. There's a jar of money there. Maybe there's that's, five grand in there. The oh, there's there's got to be at least twenty five grand in that jar. That's uh, <laughs> that's the five grand that Eddie Graham <laughs> stiffed Jerry Briscoe over. <laughs> so but the first... Paul, Paul Bosch. So Bosch Munchnik. You're Tony, right. So so Bosch was, was, Bosch was actually a. Yeah, that's a true story, y'all. Yeah, I, I, that, that was who everybody, those of us that thought we were smart in the 70s, we all just held Bosch to that highest level because uh, the class way he treated all the, the, the guys. Like other promoters were close, but nobody was Paul Bosch. No. And there so was the one guy, but he circuit, wasn't. Oh. The first closed circuit was there in LA? Yeah, they, they he did a series of them. This is promoter Mike LaBelle. So the hierarchy, the way it was, uh, Jules Strongbo had gone into business, and he was he was the lead promoter, like at the Santa Monica Civic, the Long Beach Auditorium. He was that's when they had syndicated TV on the like the Dumont Network, and uh, you know wrestling was like one of those the cheapest uh, entertainment forms that was on broadcast television nationally. So uh, Chicago from Marigold, Fred Kohler, that was syndicated. Vince Sr., uh, you know, from about 56, 57 on, that was had smaller syndication penetration. And then of course, our Jewel Strongbow from the Olympic Auditorium, uh, straight out of KTLA LA uh, was nationally syndicated. Now you're and, the, the, the were... original Jewel Strongbow you're, you're speaking of, right? Not not the one. Which is weird because when Vince Sr. brought in Chief Frank Hill from uh, Bob Geigel, Kansas City territory, uh, they used Jules Strongbow's name to put on him, pair him with Jay Strongbow, and they put the tag straps on on the two of them, you know, feuding with Masa Saito and right. Mr. Fuji and a lot of great tag teams, the Lumberjacks from Montreal. But the closed circuit, they basically were revenge matches because the greatest angle I have ever seen, and I saw I, I, Bruno Larry Zabisco is way up there. 
And I'm not talking, I'm talking at least in the 70s. Greatest angle I ever saw was ours because it spanned over like six, seven months. Uh, Freddie Blassie on our KCOP Saturday TV with Jimmy Lennon Sr., world's greatest ring announcer before the thing. And Dick Lane, who's on that Mount Rushmore with Gordon Soley, Lance Russell, maybe Bob Cottle, you know, so many great, wonderful announcers all over the place. I love Boyd Pierce. Wasn't a good announcer, but just everybody loved the guy. And he was a great foil for Bill Watts and Paul Bosch, you know, respectively, uh, their two territories. But so uh, Freddie's getting the most popular wrestler of the year award on live TV. And we were all, at least the photographers, me and Theo Eric were told, get ready. And so uh, uh, John Tolis, who had been already feuding for months with Blast. Yo, 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 you just said something that John mentioned earlier, you know, camera, you know, uh, certain people are, are left outside of our business, but you being a cameraman, you were always informed when things were going to happen or you had that had that rapport with guys where you they would kind of clue you in things are going to happen. And, yeah. and, and and so you can get the greatest shot there. That, that Particularly was, uh, when the, the Sheik was going to throw a fireball, you know, yeah, which was yeah. magician stuff, flash papers is what right. that is. I'd used it because I was an amateur magician. Yeah. So my little loves, like of magic, it, it felt in perfectly with the misdirection and the stuff going on and the art of pro wrestling, which it is a, a, one of the world's greatest art forms, American original. So uh, John Tolis goes to Dr. Bernhard Swartz's medical bag. Bernhard Swartz was our wrestling ring doctor, our boxing ring doctor, because the LaBelle family uh, promoted both at the Olympic Auditorium, but all of our other smaller venues. And, uh, our Olympic Auditorium is like our mini Madison Square Garden. Tolis is fuming, you know, oh, this good, this baby face is getting the, the wrestler of the year award. He goes into Bernhard Swartz's medical bag, gets Monsell's powder, which is basically like powdered... Um, styptic pencil stuff when you cut your face shaving it's the closed cuts on boxers you know it wasn't that it was obviously the usual stuff baby powder but he throws it in Blassie's eyes Fred already had bad eyes so they were able to play on that angle and so he blinds him it was like the whole hour was devoted to this thing in the aftermath where they bring in the medics and all of this stuff so they stop all of the matches which is what uh Vince Jr you know we call them that but in WWE all of that stuff you guys would would do later on decades later but to devote almost the whole thing to the aftermath of this angle huge angle and, and rushing them to St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica and then they taped uh over the course of you know like probably just a day or two but then they aired it for months and months Fred in the hospital with his eyes bandaged you know at the hands of John Tolis so to start the closed circuit all of Blassie's tag partners and the babyface friends. I mean, we've got to talk about how Blassie turned babyface. It was in three cage matches in the Blassie steel cage wow. with the Sheik. What and what very... what is the Blassie steel cage? I would explain. Well, that. it was first. There's it was a, wood. There's a difference. So <laughs> there's a WWE connection because it was first a rickety wood and metal cage, like probably a lot of territories had. And you had to climb up and over. There was no door. When we saw the Tri WF, the door where Bruno or Bob Backlund could open the door and get out, you know, as an alternative to climbing over the top of the cage, we go, What the F is that? No, you got to get 50 year old guys like Blasio and Tolis to climb up and over the cage, <laughs> legit risking their life. So, uh, three cage matches where, where finally uh, Abdullah Farouk, who was later in the Tri WF for Vince Sr., the Grand Wizard of Wrestling, Ernie Roth, who had four different managing names and characters like mr clean in the 50s anyway he's suspended over the ring he throws down uh, some gimmicks to the sheik but uh, blassie catches it instead and what was a heel versus heel very rare heel versus heel series fred is turned face but the guy that fully turned freddie face was rocky soul man johnson because a week later fred said i'd like to challenge you for your america's championship uh, if I do anything underhanded, if I cheat, and I'm using Blassie's exact words, I'll leave town. So they have a Broadway scientific match. That's what we call babyface, babyface matches. Told us, prove, or Freddie Blassie proves himself, and now he's teaming with uh, fantastic wrestlers what, like was Rocky Soul Johnson, Man, was Bobo Soul, Was Soul Man a hot, big hot star out there at the time? He was big. In fact, the, the, Rocky Johnson and... It was then just Peter Mavia's very first NWA title challenges were that year, 1970, in Los Angeles against the Dory Jr. 
Now, so, you, guys, you guys weren't a member of AWA or NWA or NWA. No, we were NWA members because we, our office from 1961 to 68 broke off from the NWA, but rejoined That's them in, in 68. And we were called the World Wrestling Association. So we had a world champion and world tag champions defended up and down uh, the West Coast. Hawaii for Ed Francis and Lord James Tally Ho Blairs, and most importantly for Ricky Dozan. We put the strap on Ricky Dozan twice, and then some of his wrestlers a bit later, like uh, Il Kim uh, Oki uh, for Japan Wrestling Association, which later, of course, in 72, Baba and Inoki split off to form All Japan and New Japan. But that was really what gave Ricky Dozan uh global credibility and all that stuff, not just as a wrestler, but as a major, major, major promoter. And our guys from LA at the time, Blassie, Dick Byer, the sensational intelligent destroyer and the Dusek brothers, as well as the Sharp brothers, Ben and Mike Sharp, you talk about Iron Mike Sharp, but his dad and uncle uh, were all LA guys that would be the Gaijin foreigners to come in to help Ricky Dozan's promotion get off the ground. Similar to when Inoki started New Japan, December 73, uh, 72, he brings in Carl Gotch and Luthez for the credibility right away, regular tours and, uh, and Tiger Jeet Singh, you know, from Toronto to give him the cred and get the audience there because those were all already gods. Carl Gotch and Luthez were already gods in uh, Japan. But so uh, the, the uh, Freddie Blassie, his friends like Arson Don Carson, who was a big Southeast guy, manager and wrestler, and Earl Mr. Universe Maynard and Rocky Johnson, Neil Moskers, all these guys are trying to take down Tolis's revenge for Blassie, who's laying in the hospital bed, this angle again plan over six, seven months, concluding with the big mega card. But they, some of those matches, they were all sold out because people bought in. They were emotionally invested in Blassie. Uh, there was one one of the greatest shots I have to send you my photos or Theo's photos. We gave out when Freddie turned babyface. Every one of the ten thousand four hundred. I, I would crowd. love. To, I would love to see our photos. But listen I, to this: they were all given paper cardboard head masks of Blassie. They're all wearing them, watching him in the ring. You know, a little <laughs> bit later, and it was. Uh, so I shoot the audience, but it was like when you go to a three D movie and you see everybody wearing those goofy yeah. glasses and you take pictures of the audience. No, this audience at the Olympic Auditorium, this palace for wrestling that was built. Uh, finished completion in 1925 was built for the Olympics, the first Olympics in LA, and was the house of wrestling where Shemp and Curly, Jerome of the Three Stooges, Curly's right. real name was Jerome, they went regularly to see wrestling in the 40s. And, okay, that, that's a good point. I, I have a question I want to get. What kind of clientele did you have out in Hollywood? Oh, Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby. Wow. Was, this, oh, was this on a regular basis too? Or did this was when people, JBL, when, uh, huh. when, when men would go in suits and hats and women would go in their finest, you know, so you were having all these guys, which was why in Gorgeous George, LA was his home base. He would tour all over the place. That's where he, uh, you know, he later died. In, so in some, of these, some of these names you were mentioning, you know, uh, the, the, the top, top stars were, were attending professional wrestling. Yeah, that. Jack Benny was a regular and he <laughs> had uh, Gene LaBelle, Count Billy Varga and Baron Michelle Leone, the guy that set all those right. prior Luthes right. outdoor stadium records on his TV show, the Jack Benny TV show, which was one of the top ones. George Burns and Gracie Allen came oh, wow. uh, to see wrestling in LA, you know, and not, and, and the, uh, the counterparts would be Chicago and Vince McMahon's his whole territory, uh, you know, before Madison square garden was, was the, the key, uh, the primo spot there. Um, but so those closed circuits. And then of course, I don't know why anyone would go to closed circuit when they could go to the LA Coliseum was where the Tolis Blassie outdoor show broke all of those records. All And it was closed circuited. It was the last one that LaBelle did closed circuit underneath. So they were billing it as the two greatest feuds in wrestling, Tolis Blassie. And then the one that was even longer was Sheik and Bobo Brazil. But you wow. had the biggest feud in Mexico in the original El Solitario, who was like the tiger mass Satoru Sayama of his day against Mil Mascaris. And I mean, that match, it was like, Ray Jr. against Juventud Guerrero or something like that. It was off the charts. Or today's Omega Will Osprey. It was just off the charts. That was the bout of the night. But then you had two of the greatest heel tag teams in all of uh, California wrestling, Gorman and Goliath, and then Kenji Shibuya and Masa Saito. Masa Saito sent to L.A. as punishment from uh, Giant Baba. 
or I forget what he did, but he was sent to LA and then he really liked it in America. And he, you know, often he would go back and forth. I think he did, never went back to Baba. He went back to Inoki when he, you know, was home basing in Japan, but he went everywhere. He went to Florida, obviously. Yeah, he with, was uh, great Mr. Hito. Mr. Hito there. And, and Sato. So how did yeah, the book circuit do? It did very well. I mean, they did, they did, uh, nearly 29,000 at the LA Coliseum, but they did a bigger gate at, at all the closed circuits. So all of these theaters, you'd have this stuff and sometimes you'd lose signal. I mean, yeah. I was at the show, so I, but I heard from what, those who went, you know, if there were, cause you know, if, if it's a real schlep, like three hours to LA, if you're in San Bernardino or Bakersfield or Reno, you're, you know, you can get it on closed circuits. You're going to go uh, for that, but they did very well financially. That was a, that was what Mike LaBelle, promoter Mike LaBelle. So here's the what happened when the WW when LA had its own world title office, and it was well respected. I mean, it was like second to the NWA, even bigger than the AWA at that point. Um, you know, again with the guys in Japan and our champions all up and down the state, and, and a lot of appearances for Roy Shire at the Cow Palace in Hawaii at the HAC Arena, which is, was renamed Blaisdell. But that was the palace in Hawaii for Ed Francis, former wrestler, son, Russ Francis, and his other ones. I think they were all yeah, NFL uh, players. Played, played the 49ers, yeah. Yeah, one of the greatest and, players. And, of and also was in WrestleMania, what, four? Uh, two in the Battle Royal, the NFL the Battle, Battle Royal, Royal that had the fridge, yeah. Refrigerator yeah. Perry. I sat next to at the 2015 WrestleMania press conference right in front row with Russ Francis. He did PR work uh, all around the West Coast for Vince and the WWE. I had too much to drink at a WrestleMania party and I danced with, with William Perry. I mean, me and him dancing together. Was, that uh, is too much to drink, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. glad you stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, so back, back to the Coliseum. So Shibuya and Sato against Gorman and Goliath, second match of the night, just up and down stellar card. Pat Patterson was in the opener. <laughs> We had something else. We had a very you know, brief... there, 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 there's something going on there. Pipe was in opener. Jack and Terry Funk were in the opener. Pat Patterson in the opener. What were they? They were waiting for all these future Hall of Famers to blossom. What was the deal? On no, Pat, Pat was often in main events, though. He was in a main event. He had two very rare, two America's title matches with Ed Carpentier, who I got to shoot. Ed Carpentier gets your brother Jack for the NWA Championship. A, a even though very stylistically different because Carpentier did all the flying stuff and Jack, you know, amateur. I think was an athlete too. <laughs> but I, I marked out. Somebody had a show. It was either WWE or AEW, like in Canada. And somebody held up a Carpentier Hall of Fame. Oh. So Ed Carpentier worked tons of MSG shows for Vince McMahon Senior. He should be in there. Uh, the guy was so a good let, let me ask you. I've often heard about Gorgeous George. I'm a big fan of George. And in fact, there's a great book. I can't. Uh, Jack Capuya wrote it. Right, right. I helped him with that. He was a Sports Illustrated oh, writer. What? That was one of the best wrestling books I've ever read. It just yep. absolutely fantastic. Um, about Gorgeous George. What was the name of it? It wasn't named Gorgeous George. It was named something else, wasn't it? No, so there was another book. Gorgeous. Wait, Don Leo Jonathan's. Uh, I think it was a family relative and uncle wrote whatever happened to gorgeous George, but that came out in 73, but John Capoy is from about eight, nine years ago. I don't remember the title. Oh, just still available. But they you talk know, about, you know, the, the advent of television, you know, that's when, uh, you know, George just hit it perfect with the advent of television being out there in LA, being at the center of the world and television, you know, like you say, wrestling being so easy to shoot, you know, you just need a one camera shoot or you know, the, the action is pretty much relegated. But it got the biggest it, ratings. It got it, it only second, only to your show of shows with Sid Caesar and Milton Burrell's uh, show. That, it was that was on, the like, phrase was that gorgeous George, they called him Georgie sets. He said he sold more TV sets than Milton Burrell. So was George, George, I'm a huge fan. Was George that big of a star? Oh, he was huge. Wherever he was a touring attraction when he was the first touring attraction. If you put aside what we called the midgets, little people, and then the women who had a really rough go, often putting on better shows and bouts than the guys. He was like the first touring attraction. Then there was Happy Humphreys, who Harley Race broke in, driving him around bathing him by hosing him off. You know, the guy was billed as over 600 pounds. Then Haystack Calhoun, Matt Mike, Mike, and finally uh, Andre, big touring attraction, although Vince McMahon Sr. was the promoter after the Vashons and Ed Carpente kind of sold the rights to Vince McMahon Sr., you know, bringing him in from Paris. And Andre was first sent from Paris to 
the oldest Japanese promotion or second only to Ricky Dozens, IWE, AWE affiliated, but he's paired with Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson, who watched over Andre and helped him navigate Japan and then help, you know, dropped him off in Montreal where Don Leo Jonathan, Killer Kowalski, The Vachans, Paul and Maurice, uh, Carpentier, so many others, Killer Kowalski, all sort of spent a whole year and a half uh, getting him ready for Vince Senior to send him everywhere. So and then, of course, one of his first tours was to England uh, and he stayed with Tony St. Clair and his parents and they asked him for breakfast what he wanted. He goes, just beer, beer. You know, he was a young kid then. He still, he loved already it. drank it. He nearly, he tried at our territory, LA, he wasn't successful. He tried breaking the Guinness Book of World Records. We had an officiator. It was December 74, trying to break for most consecutive cans of beer. And he passed out about 16 cans short of the wow. record of like 345 cans no. of beer consecutively. No. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and that, and, and that, who, that, who was the that was certified. That was certified, right? Yeah, they actually had people there. They were trying oh. to do it. And all of his, that was when uh, Louis Tillet from Florida and Georgia right. was booking. And we had a whole contingent from Montreal. We had the Hollywood Blondes. The original ones was Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Red was his, what we all called him. Uh, G Dino Bravo. And and some other guys, Carpentier and Bobby Shane on his way to Japan came in. Then Bobby Shane was back when at KCOP TV Studios, Channel Thirteen. When so Andre how, how many beers did Andre drink at Saturday? Uh, three hundred and what? Like, a little over three hundred. He was just like fourteen uh, to sixteen cans shy. I'd have to look up my and records. What was it? Who like John asked? Who was it? Was it was a no name guy you'd never heard of. Uh, uh, so I think probably somebody from Scotland or Ireland. <laughs> Put away the pints. Yeah. The real, a real man put away those pints. <laughs> it would, probably would have been Seamus by now if it was modern day. Yeah, but back, back real quick to Gorgeous George. He was banned in a lot of territories, right? From from going to those territories because of his character. A lot of guys did not want him because of his character. Yeah, because it was an effeminate. What it's not PC to call it a gay act, but that's what it was called in those times. And um, I don't know because he had Cherie Dupree. He had. I have some Gorgeous George stories and ribs. Uh, he had his uh, his most well-known wife as his valet. And he had, towards the end, he had a steps match with the whipper Billy Watson, former NWA champion that Luthes had picked as champion. Uh, hair versus hair, and George refused to lose. So he didn't want to honor the steps because he had one more payday from us in L.A. on hair versus mask against the destroyer, Dick Byer. So he sent Cherie, and she had her head shaved in lieu of him getting his head shaved. And then he comes to L.A., the last match, his very last payday, you know, he's down on his luck. He put all his money into a turkey farm <laughs> way ahead of his time for ground turkey meat, which now, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody for the last 30, 40 years has been eating ground turkey, you know, try to stay healthy instead of beef. But he bought this ranch in like 1961, 60 wow. or 61, way ahead of his time, but nobody would buy it. None of the stores would stock it. Safeway, the stores out in the, the West Coast. And and that's when George had his head shaved and, and Dick Byer, you know, didn't lose his sock, as he called it, which is uh, it, destroyer Dick Byer. His he had two wives, both named Wilma. You know, how many guys? <laughs> that's a very uncommon name. But yeah. uh, the the first one was the one Fred, who Fred out of Flintstone had a wife named Wilma. Right, Wilma's exactly. Story. But that's the only other one I know of. <laughs> but Dick Byer's first wife out of her pantyhose so the first destroyer, sensational, intelligent destroyer, god of Japan, mass for Dick Byer, out of just women's stocking hosiery. But uh, Gorgeous George um, too, the guy from uh, the Southeast, I know Jerry had run into him. Uh, I, I don't know if he worked more than three or four dates for Eddie Graham, but he comes into LA in 74. I'm just getting off topic quickly, but he comes out He's wearing all the same stuff. They're falsely advertising him as the son of Gorgeous George. Uh, oh, yeah, George. Jr. April of yeah, 1974. Yeah. He comes out to Pompa he was, he, was a, what, he was a good guy. I mean, well, he was he a was good the guy. He was arrested but... in Tijuana, wasn't he, Jerry? The what? He was the one arrested in Tijuana, wasn't he? Remember, yeah. uh, was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was him. Yeah, was but, it Hector but... that told us the story? I can't remember, but it, it, it was the, one of the girls, wasn't it? Yeah, he was down. He was down there, and then one of the guys he was with had gotten into a, a scuffle or something, and told him to don't don't say our names. The police came. They're looking for the other guy, 
it's, it's on one of our shows and and they, he said the other wrestler's name that's who they're looking for and so they arrested him and gory guerrero had to go down with hector i believe it was hector went yeah, hector, down, yeah. and hey, it was hector yeah went down and yeah. picked him up at five o'clock in the morning and as he's going yeah. out all the guys are whistling at him and he's uh, we, we we painted george's uh at- uh, El Dorado, El, El Camino, what was it? El Dorado Lavender before he went to LA, Mike. That Briscoe Brothers Demonic Show. Oh, there. before I forget though, so Gorgeous George Jr., 74, appears on our TV the first night Cherie Dupree, the original Gorgeous George, George right. Wagner's widow, who was his valet, sees this, gets the attorneys on it. <laughs> he was out of there after two shows, and it was made our newspapers <laughs> that she sued over his trademark, his likeness. Um, but here's another one. Similarly, uh, Paul Pershman, who Vern Gagne trained, who became Playboy Buddy Rose, he just does one shot for us for TV. He's on his way just after Vern broke him in. It was like 70, late 73, early 74. On his way to Japan, and he's put on TV with a Phoenix jobber doing a gay out act who's called just Buddy Rose, wearing pink chaps, pink baseball hat, pink boots. And so Buddy Rose goes, and over there he starts using that name, and then he puts, you know, the straight version of the, you know, he's non-effeminate. Then once he got to Japan, Paul Pershman, he calls himself Playboy Buddy Rose, but he got his work name from just this no-name jobber doing an effeminate gay cowboy act in L.A. at the Olympic (laughs) Auditorium on our Wednesday night TV, which was still nationally syndicated to all of the bigger Hispanic uh, cities around the country in the 70s. Let's go, let, let's go back to George, George Sr. Uh, All right. Uh, you, are you pretty familiar with his career? And, and got, well, uh, he worked everywhere. He was a touring attraction. I, I, I know, but were you were pretty familiar with that? The, the screw job out in Chicago with uh, who was Don Eagle? Don Eagle. Chief Don Eagle. Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you know about that? uh just the stuff i've read so it's just all hearsay okay, okay hearsay that's basically what john and i because it, it never affected george and you know they never gave him the title or anything like that so i just wanted well, to... he, he won the title and then i don't even he didn't even, I don't even know if he dropped it or anything if he dropped it he dropped it within a week or two later it wasn't it wasn't a big deal to george you know it's, it's all a big deal to get al half to those guys that were in chicago you know it's all a, a power struggle with don eagle who they couldn't deal with and so they wanted to hurt him and so they pulled the screw job on him with the the quick count. Yeah, Don Eagle kind of spelled the end for Fred Kohler, who had that syndicated TV out of uh, Chicago's Marigold Arena for years and years and years. And that was big. That's where people first saw the fabulous kangaroos, Costello and the uh, Heffernan and the Bavarian boys, all of it. Johnny Valentine, that's the first national TV Johnny Valentine, who hated this. Anytime he'd come into LA, our booker genius, Jules Strongbow would always book him as uh, Cowboy Rocky Valentine, which Johnny hated. He goes, why can't I use my my real name? Uh, JBL doesn't even know this. I did a book with Johnny Valentine, uh, getting him a cassette recorder in uh, 95. Uh, and I just told him to record, we called the book Rip. I thought of that title. I go, just intersperse your life story with all the ribs that you and Buddy Rogers played. And most of them involve feces that we can't tell probably on this show uh to promoters we were, i mean that, that back in hotels. those days that, you, i guess that was the wrestler's big rib because you said blast you and and, and and when the la rams would have a football player that wanted to try wrestling he would always put well, yeah, uh, in, they, they 60, some, uh, some prizes in their bags that was for the year that uh, dr sam shepherd who they based his whole character for the tv show with uh, david jansen the fugitive, oh, the fugitive in the 60s yeah. which had the number one conclusion before dallas beat it and i always think of uh, the dallas music as sort of the precursor to jbl's entrance music with the, the yeah, cow, they you know, JBL. You immediately think of texas when you think of jbl's entrance music but uh geez um about Sam, about Sam Shepard. Yeah, Sam Shepard came in the same time that the two Rams, Don Chewy and I forget the other guy's name, Joe Corolla for the LA Rams. They were bitching that they were only making thirty-five to forty thousand a year with the NFL. They'd make, you know, a lot right away. So the offseason they would wrestle. Blassie did not like a purist. He didn't like outsiders coming into his world. I mean, who can blame him? They didn't show him proper respect. So any Ram that would come in like those two and 
I think it was 1967, he took a crap in their gym bags. Later on in 73, another hotshot Ram, Dwayne Allen from the LA Rams, who wanted to, to wrestle in the off season, big mark, and didn't show uh, Blassie or Tola's proper respect and got a dump, a number, a deuce in his gym bag, <laughs> courtesy of Fred Blassie, did who was guys, on his did, way. Did, did, did these guys continue wrestling or was that it? One, one, no. One, no, once they had, they were scared shitless. Yeah. Dwayne Allen was scared shitless of Blassie. That was well, it. He quit that know. night. Yeah. Uh, was, did, you, uh, did you ever know Art Mahalik? Oh, are you kidding? Boom, boom, Art Mahalik? Boom, boom, Art, Maha yeah. Art Mahalik. He, he, he was my Japanese mentor. I went on my first Japan six-week tour with him. He was boom, like boom. a father to me. <laughs> he was a great, great wrestler. He was on the cover of yeah, uh, Stan Weston's Wrestling Review around 1965. Great wrestler. But he basically wanted to work a limited schedule. And from about 1969 on until he retired in 73, he was just a TV enhancement guy. We had some of the best in hand, but he was the king of that. And uh, our referees in L.A., Johnny Red Shoes Dugan, who the current New Japan Red Shoes, that guy was a... Mark growing up watching him because Inoki would bring our guy, our referee. Our referees were celebs like Vince Senior's refs, like uh, the, the two main guys that uh, Vince McMahon Senior had throughout the 70s and through about Dick Worley and Dick Prohl. Well, yeah. Hank Matheny, who was in a, a number, anytime Jack Benny had wrestlers on or soupy sales, they would have Hank Matheny, who was totally bald, but they would call him Curly Matheny on the shows. He refereed for Bob, as did uh, another one of our refs. And uh, Red Shoes Johnny Dugan was brought over at least 50 tours for Inoki. But he was our lead senior referee in L.A. And Jerry Murdoch was another one. Jerry Murdoch and Hank Matheny refed a ton for Baba, who would bring him in from our home base territory, L.A. But uh, I was going to also mention very quickly, Vern Gagne trying to defeat Mike LaBelle coming in in 1969 partnering with Jack Kent Cook and his uh, LA Fabulous Forum venue that he owned. He also owned the LA Lakers basketball team, the NHL LA Kings hockey team. So he partners with Byrne. I'm gonna make this really short. And Mike LaBelle calls up Munchnik and they start this whole promotion they called Save Our Sports. So Munchnik sends in guys from all of the territories, like the opening match for one of these shows. And Dory Jr. defended the NWA strap on all of these shows in opposition to Vern Gagne's two shows at the Forum. And, uh, you know, Vern Gagne had Thez on his card. Like, the main event was Vern against Dick the Bruiser, uh, who was still a heel for the A.W. title. Lou Thez against uh, uh, Kurt's dad, Larry. The Vachon brothers were on it, the Blackjacks. But on top for us, uh, Moss, or, uh, Dory Jr. defended in, in three different shows right after he won the title in, in 69. So it was against uh, Neil Moskers, Freddie Blassie, and I think Buddy Killer Austin. But the, the cards were stacked, like an opener, Bo Ubers, or uh, Pedro Morales against, uh, uh, was it Ernie Ladd? The, the stack, Don Leo Jonathan and King Curtis Iakea against uh, Pat Patterson, Ray Stevens. You just had some amazing stuff. Johnny Rubberman Walker, pre-Mr. Wrestling 2 days, came in against... Uh, uh, Ray Guillotine Gordon, uh, another Southeast wrestler. But all of these guys that you would never see, so the fans didn't really know who they were, still sold the place out. But that was the end of it uh, because Vern didn't draw well. And so LaBelle, with the help of Munchnik and the NWA and all of the various promotions, thwarted what that was whole Vern's territory. Idea? Was Vern trying to take over national uh, wrestling? He wanted to get into to California. Like a lot of people forget that uh, a year plus before Vince McMahon Jr., uh, went national. Uh, he, he he bought Mike LaBelle. Mike LaBelle, my boss, finally sold our office. It was dying a slow death under good guy, super nice guy, but maybe his booking was faltering. And Tom Ernesto, who Jerry knew very, very well. And so Mike LaBelle sells the territory to Vince Jr. in December of 1982. And Vince McMahon Jr. was already going to war with Vern Gagne in both San Francisco and LA, they were running opposing buildings, sometimes the same nights. Like in San Francisco, uh, Vince would run the San Francisco Cal Palace, which was the crown jewel, as Roy Shires called it for his many venues. And uh, Vern would run at the open indoor Coliseum Arena. And, uh, you know, like, so, but the funny thing is, 
uh, Roy Shire, my boss in San Francisco, who promoted from uh, like January 1961 until his last show, January of 82, which was his last great battle royal annual show with six NWA, either former or current world champions. At that point, Harley was uh, the current champion, but he had Kadiski and uh, Dory and Terry and Dusty on this. So in the very last three shows for Roy Shire, he had gone through different offices. He lost TV in San Francisco. You know, he had live TV or taped every Saturday, but he lost it when he refused to stop spitting cigar juice on the floors as per management at KTV, TVU Channel 2, our strongest independent. So first for year and a half he goes to don owen in portland and they he just use don owen's tv with localized interviews they would tape talking about cal valley shows and then a year and a half he uses Geigel's kansas city with brody and guys like that but his last three shows were then, then the best of the bunch florida, florida right when, when yeah we're all with florida so he'd bring in mike graham and uh, dusty teaming with mike and barry windham and lord l hayes was still wrestling i mean i saw l hayes in england family trip in 73 in England and he was Judo L. Hayes, the name he'd used for Amarillo, his first American territory for Dory Sr. in Amarillo. Well, I, and he was a credible wrestler. He was a badass. Uh, yeah. Al Hayes, so if you see him as this kind of mushy, soft guy starting at 83 for Vince Jr., you had no idea. This guy was a credible wrestler. Well, he, and, manager. And, and, and he had him down here as a real credible wrestler. I yeah, mean, but he came in and wrestled. Bring in. Yeah, he, he was a tough guy down there. And, uh, but listen well, to this. He, he was so, still Lord Alfred Hayes, but he was he was a right. serious Lord. No, no, I saw him, uh, and he'd work matches. So he, he, was would, a, he was a regal type worker. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a shame they never let on that this guy was a wrestler in, you know, the rock and wrestling connection days. But he did wrestle uh, for us. I saw him and took pictures of him in the AWA when he's managing uh, Bob Remus under the hood as, you know, the super destroyer Mark IV. And uh, Don Jardine was one of the early ones. So paired, you know, getting a green, young, up and coming Bob Remus over. And then Al Hayes is uh, battling Heenan. Uh, you know, both did double turns and whatnot. But so Roy Shire knew that Vern and Vince are coming in after his last show. They know they're coming in uh, with their own battle royals, like three weeks after Roy Shire had his very last card, which was his annual January battle royal. So he goes to the LA Times and the San Francisco Chronicle, the biggest newspapers in California, exposes the biz to try to F it up. And that was Roy's exact words to me in the office because I worked for him and his publicist, Davey Rosenberg, is he goes, I'm going to, I don't know if I can curse, but I'm going to F it up for Vern and Vince who are coming in to eat the bones of my territory. Which so was like, and just expose the it was a scandal. It was yeah. like the stupidest, craziest and then thing. And how, how did he call what the, he did to do the, the LA newspaper or uh, the uh, San Francisco newspaper? He did it through the LA newspaper, right? He did it first to the L.A. newspaper, which made no sense because, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> you know, Roy's territory was San Francisco. Yeah. Although he didn't get along with Mike LaBelle. The okay. Thing was, uh, the, the question that, 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 that we've been wanting to know, was, was there any animosity between the offices between L.A. and, and San Francisco? That didn't yes. Do... And it was all on Shire's part. He didn't okay. respect he didn't respect Mike LaBelle, who was simply the son so here's the scenario. Jewel Strongbow, promoter and genius booker from the 50s. You say genius TV. booker is that facetious? Or, or... No, 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 okay. he was. He All concocted right. that whole thing with the club. Well, he promoted uh, Thez against uh, Count Billy Varga and former San Francisco 49er Leo Namalini, which right. broke all the records up and down the state in the 50s, all the way through. Then, long story short, he he decided to, to go to work for the guy that he was battling, Cal Eaton, who was a non-wrestler, money mark, promoter. So Cal Eaton would front all the money and Jules could just do what he did now, best. Cal, is both. Cal the one that was in on all the roller derbies or is that up in San Francisco? No, that was different. That was the Griffiths family, Bill okay. Griffiths. Okay. But a lot of people thought that Cal Eaton and his wife, now Cal dies in like 67 and then his widow, Eileen Eaton, becomes the god female promoter of boxing hall of fame boxing promoter her two sons with a prior husband labelle were mike and gene labelle everybody loved judo gene labelle who did so much for i mean he he broke in ronda rousey for judo got her helped her get her gold medals in judo then mma with first strike force and then ufc and then he helped train her for pro wrestling before he passed away he did so much for roddy piper's career 
and like Stu Hart's lead Davy face Dan Crawford, who would come down from Calgary to LA, uh, like Bad News Brown, uh, Alan Collage. Gene LaBelle would finesse him for New Japan and Anoki and send him after they worked a little in LA, send him to uh, New Japan. But um, the, the animosity was, so then Strongbow is just simply booking first for Cal Eaton and then he dies. And then uh, Eileen Eaton promotes her son, Mike LaBelle, non-wrestler, didn't grow up watching wrestling, didn't grow up respecting it, only interested in money which is why Bruno San Martino told him to F himself after his second time working for us in 72. Uh, long story, he and Walter Kowalski told Mike LaBelle to F himself. Bruno said he'd never work for Mike LaBelle again. So Roy Shire gets wind of this because Roy Shire had a great relationship with Bruno San Martino, who had one of the first inner promotional uh, matches when he brought his Tri-WF title, basically his Vince McMahon Senior Capital Sports title to San Francisco for two title versus title bouts versus Roy Shire's U.S. champion, Ray Stevens. And uh, those just sold out. He, Roy lamented that he didn't go closed circuit with that. And we're talking 1967, 68. But Mike, uh, excuse me, Roy had no respect for Mike LaBelle, who most people despised. He'd short the guys on occasion. Now, Mike had some strengths and all of that stuff, particularly, you know, going with Jules and Leo Garibaldi as bookers. But Roy didn't respect Mike, so he would ask every week one of our office guys, Art Williams, to send some of our major talent up there. And he gave the impression he was going to give him a little push in San Francisco, but instead they just jobbed. So, like, even Neil Moskras, our one of our main event guys, would go up there. And the only guy that Roy Shire ever would use and he would always make these requests every three weeks can you send me some talent for my undercard on my tv was blassie blassie would come up and he'd be in main event six mans with ray stevens and pat patterson and uh because fred blassie and roy share had a long history Roy, and I got Fred to admit this. Pencil neck geek was a an expression Roy Shires used first as Professor Roy Shire, and Fred took it from him with Roy's blessing. But they had a great rapport relationship, so Fred was always happy to come up and work for Roy in San Francisco at the Cow Palace or the Sacramento uh, Auditorium or San Jose Civic, where a former NWA World Junior Champion like Jerry Briscoe, John Swensky, but decades before Jerry, ran the towns for, or ran San Jose for Roy Shire and was Roy's policeman, legit hooker shooter, and uh, wasn't necessarily, you know, used ever in that capacity. The only time he was, was when Florida Frankie Kane, the great Mephisto right. came in, Mephisto. booked and was on top as lead heel for Roy, got shorted on money and slapped Roy in the face <laughs> in front of the boys in the locker room, took the guy that, that did our program then Victor Berry with him and quit. That was infamous store stuff yeah. of legend because Roy was a tough guy, a little squat, tough pistol well, of a guy. So like was Ray Frankie Stevens though. Was. Frankie was a tough, tough. Oh. tough. <laughs> Frankie, wonderful, wonderful person. And Frankie and Frankie, uh, well, Frankie was one of those old time stretchers, the hookers, Don, you know, with Billy Wicks type guy that would oh. hook you. <laughs> but but uh, Frankie Kane and Teresa Thies, who went on to marry Ray Stevens broke Ray Stevens into pro wrestling. And of all places in Memphis, no one ever yeah. thinks that when they think of Memphis, you don't think of Ray Stevens. No, you don't. There, there was a guy who, uh, for San Francisco, he was like the equivalent of Blassie or Bruno yeah. for Vince Sr. Yeah. or many for Eddie Graham or Dick yeah. the Bruiser in his own territory. That was, you know, synonymous. Tell, tell uh, us some Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson stories and rib because they, they were they were famous in, in San Francisco area and the California area and, and, and their ribs were, were pretty famous. So. Well, you would hear this because Peter Mavia and his wife, then Leah, would have after show after Cow Palace parties at their home in South San Francisco and Daly City barbecues where the heels and faces would get together. I mean, that was like unheard of. But wow. it, it was in Hawaii because Ray had a, a great working relationship with promoter Ed Francis and Tally Ho James Blears. Tally Ho Blears, yeah. Uh, in Hawaii. And so Ray and Nick, this is a combined rib. Uh, and I talked to you about it because you'd heard of that happening yourself yeah. on a separate instance. But yeah. Pat Patterson is over there with Ray Stevens and their other best friend, Nick Bockwinkle. 
And it was at a time when the more athletic roller derby, as opposed to the Los Angeles Bill Griffiths roller games, which was like theatric with long promos and match races, which were their equivalent of a singles main event world title match, but for derby, you know, doing it at high speed, which had to be tough. It's like pro wrestling, but at high speed on wheels at 35 miles per hour. Yeah. Roller derby, the top league in the world, based out of San Francisco and Roy Shire's talent, uh, are their tours were both at the same time in in Oahu in, in Hawaii, and so Ray basically the gist of this is Ray and Nick get Pat drunk. They put a Mickey in his drink or something. They put him to bed. They put Annie Calvello, who was the fabulous moolah of roller derby. She was the one with ble with the bleached hair, but every week she would put in silhouettes and color of like the Beatles or Elvis in her hair, which Dennis Rodman credited for stealing her gimmick. <laughs> you decades later but she That's was doing insane. seven decade skater so like lou says she performed in seven decades which was incredible oh. so they put annie calvella who was pretty hot at the time beautiful in the 60s whatever year that was but i think this was 71 in bed and when pat woke up he screamed i mean he was just screaming he wakes <laughs> up he sees this girl in bed with him went ballistic but Ray and Nick were nowhere to be found because they had taken off their clothes they were and they supposedly they said they just escaped getting arrested. They were riding naked up and down Mount Haleakala. They were in Maui, you know, nearby island, going up to the crater to see the sun rise at the, the volcano, yeah, but right. totally butt naked, scaring <laughs> everybody. It's colder than hell up there too, by the way. <laughs> uh, God, uh, Ray and was- And so Pat, Pat thought he had committed a sin. Pat thought he had slept uh, with a woman. Yeah, that's I must somebody must have heard of that, like a Mabel, like you were talking about. Yeah. Like the Mabel I'd heard of was the first time that I'd heard of it was done. Paul, Paul Vachon, who we just lost, beloved Paul Butcher Vachon, right. had yeah, so many guy. stories yeah. wrestling in front of, and he said, Yeah, they let a lot of the people in free, like 120,000 in India against Dara Singh and Gama Singh. But uh, the Mabel story was the thing that they pulled with Great Antonio, who had just come back from disrespecting Inoki. Uh, he was still, New Japan hadn't been created yet. It was still JWA, Ricky Dozan. They still called it the JWA. And he just didn't sell or show any respect for Inoki. So Inoki shot him, destroyed him. And a uh, great Antonio comes back to Montreal with his tail between his legs. And uh, so they did that thing where they set him up with a, a girl. And and then, the, you know, the, the husband comes with the shotgun and all this shit to just teach him a lesson. That was that Mabel story. Um, the most Ray, famous one is the, the Don Jardine one. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of the Ray Stevens stuff. The uh, He was always at odds with, because he was paired with Ray Stevens. They were in some territories called the, the Shire Brothers, Ray right, right Stevens and Roy, and Roy yeah. Shire. And yeah. another one says the Stevens Brothers. And another Stevens <laughs> brother was Donnie Fargo who was paired with, with Ray early on as the Stevens brothers. But this is the one that was living under a bridge in the golf coast, golf stage, right? You know, yeah, you know golf... a lot of these ribs are actually crimes. You know, that, that, actually... nowadays they, are... they would be. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I've got one. So Ray was part of one with Mr. Fuji, but in Portland, <laughs> where they were always picking on Fuji, which is in the 60s and 70s, which is why I think late 70s on, you know, when he homesteaded with Vince McMahon Jr. and, you know, the wwf for the rest of his career pretty much uh he was you know a master rib guy like uh, dynamite kid and i think kurt hennig did his share of ribs but so they i forgot what was happening they they knocked out fuji they put some stuff in his drinks and then Which they're again, going to a, a town crime. yes <laughs> a crime a total jpl's absolutely correct they knock him out they, they wanted to repay him for something he'd pulled on them so they take off all his clothes they put him in a hotel pond. It was like a, a pretty large pond, but they put him on a, a pond to it or a raft in the center of this butt naked and he's knocked out. And the morning comes and all these women are screaming and the cops are called. And, you know, Fuji wasn't aware that, I forget if it was, I think it was Maurice Vachon with Ray Stevens and somebody else, maybe Dutch Savage, who was Luke Brown's legit brother, Luke Brown of the Kentuckians, paired with uh, Grizzly Smith. They were famous, you know, for Bill Watts, for Leroy McGurk, and they, of course, wrestled in the 60s for Vince McMahon Sr. in Capital Sports and the whole Gold Dust Trio with Toots Mont. Uh, 
Um, but uh, there was some other stuff, not quite a rib, but like Bearcat, the two first African-American world champions for a true world champion, not Ron Simmons, who we all love and totally respect, perhaps more famous because, you know, everybody got to see that WCW stuff when he beat, I think Vader, he beat Vader, Leon. Yeah, but involved. Bearcat Wright and Bo Brazil at least twice both held the WWA world title in Los Angeles. And Bearcat Wright, when it's time to do the favor and drop it back to Freddie Blassie, Bearcat refused. So both in the ring and then a little bit later that night uh, in the parking lot where the boys parked, the private parking lot, Gene LaBelle, hooker shooter, trained by Carl Gotch and Luthez and a bit with uh, Strangler Lewis, just walks straight towards Bearcat Wright, who I'm told I wasn't there. This was like 63 peas in his pants. Like pee, you can see the pee coming onto the asphalt, drops the strap, gets in his car and splits. Another time, although this wasn't quite the same, but it, it was sort of like what Stan yeah, Hansen would pull. Is that, is that pretty well documented because I, I don't yeah oh yeah that. eyewitnesses to bearcat being afraid that gene was going to shoot on him and stretch well, him. wow like bearcat was a big big guy too man and actually la was bearcat rights as a, a wrestler i know he managed in florida and he wrestled but i think being world champion twice in la that was one of his bigger territories working with blasty the sharps destroyer dick buyer uh both of the kangaroos and tag matches. And Bearcat was big until that point. And surprisingly, it was like Vince McMahon Jr. They, they mended fences and he came back to work in 1971 for uh, Los Angeles after you know eight, nine years of being banished, never allowed back after you know that little scenario. But- um, You know what's so amazing both- about these ribs is that you, know, you look at them now and, and legitimately they're crimes and people yeah. look at them. But back then, you go, oh, so and so just Mickey me. They drugged you, <laughs> it wasn't, you know. But back then, it was it was just part of what we did. And, and crazy as that sounds, that well, it was like college like, initiation pranks, you know, like a freshman uh, pledging for a fraternity or something like that. Well, um, I, college, I, I have no issue with it. I'm just telling you that yeah. you're looking looking. Well, no, down you should because you were partaked in a lot of them. I, I partook <laughs> in a lot. I got ribbed a lot. Yeah, I, you you would have been arrested a lot, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen to this no, one. No, this no, is no, the... no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I got oh. go ahead. I'm sorry, and I don't mean to interrupt you guys because no, you guys ahead. are the masters, and it's your show, not <laughs> mine. But jeez. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jerry, go ahead. Well, I, you know, I'm approaching 70 and I just lost my <laughs> well, train. I'm of... approaching 78. I, I wanted to get in on Piper. You know, we hit on Piper when he came through and uh, Leo Garibaldi was there. Was that his first time there? Or was that the time when when Piper and, and Chavo and the, and, and, and the Grills really hit it off? Chavo, came, Gory came in with Chavo in August of 1975. We re, had a really lean year where I just Shire, had a damn spider this side running by my feet every time I'm looking down. <laughs> I'm in Florida. I'm in, Flo- I'm, right in, I'm in Florida, so <laughs> we got big spider. So, okay. so uh, Chavo, so we had a really lean year. Like uh, Roy Steve, Royce Shire, the one time that he really had to send talent down from San Francisco. Like he sent Pat Patterson and Tony Garea as tag champs down to LA to work because Mike LaBelle every, had shed all this talent. Everybody had split. Pampiro Furpo, Ed Carpentier, The Sheik, Mighty Igor, Dick uh, Garza, all these great talents uh, left. The Hollywood Blondes had, had split. So LaBelle is left high and dry. So Gory Guerrero comes in to introduce his son. They showed weeks of vignettes at Chavo. And... Uh, and then Gory has to go back and run El Paso, his own territory. So he called in the favor, as did uh, then Booker Louis Tillet right before Garibaldi took over. So this is the transition. And Paul Vachon came in to be paired as a baby face. It was the weirdest thing with Chavo to help get him over. And then a couple of months later, Roddy Piper debuts January of 1976. He was only supposed to do a one shot, but because he got over so so quickly, uh, Michael Bell and Jules, are, our bookers, then asked Roy Shire if, if Piper could stay. And he would eventually go up to San Francisco. He was the only guy, to my knowledge, to hold two major titles and main event, like he'd main event in LA as our top champion at the Olympic Auditorium on a Friday. The next night at the Cow Palace for Roy Shire in San Francisco as the US champion. And similar to Shibuya and Saito, who held both the tag straps in two totally different unrelated territories, 
again, LA and San Francisco in 71. So Piper is comes in and then the vignettes start from Mondo. For like three months, we see these vignettes from sent in from El Paso. Mondo Guerrero is coming. And then Mondo does well. And a year later, vignettes again for Hector, who came in very slowly. But when the whole family was there, that's you know, a little bit later, that's when we saw Eddie there as a uh, you know, little, little baby. So were you there when uh, they did the, the, the angle? Because I always thought that Chavo, part of his inspiration for the angle with me and Eddie Guerrero, with the mother having the heart attack in El Paso on Mother's Day weekend when they were honoring uh, Gordy Guerrero, was off of the L.A. Coliseum storyline that he did with uh piper when piper brought the donkey out and said this is you know it's not the same story but it's the same idea of t attacking the family personally were you there when they did that with uh the girl with the donkey and this is uh this is the this is gory guerrero he did the whole thing chavo actually got mad about it at first according to chavo jr when we had him on the show I was there for that. I was not for the one uh, about the same time in San Francisco for Shire. He'd lost Pat. Uh, Roy, Roy Shire claimed he fired Pat when he found out he was gay, which was a total lie. Pat instead was billing himself as the U.S. champion for LaBelle in L.A., which was why Shire fires him. But Kevin Solomon came in with Bob Roop, amateur god, and to both book and be lead uh, heel and face respectively bob roop goes so they had this angle there very similar with uh, kevin sullivan as lead baby face his dad in front row that bob roop attacks and beat the you know the shit up at least you know to the marks uh fully bought into that so the exact same time as the thing in uh, los angeles with chavo and piper and that ended up doing big business for chavo and piper right big business yeah after the dismal 1975, they really, from 76 through the two and a half years Piper spent uh, in Los Angeles, at the same time, main eventing for Shire, you know, which had to be exhausting for him, and then doing all of our, as many club dates in LA as he did in Northern California for Shire, a you know, big, big business uh, until uh, Roddy Guy you know, got stiffed on his pay envelope from LaBelle, and that's when he ended up meeting his the guy he called his father, Don Owen in Portland, he completely left. He had enough of LA. And that's when, as uh, Jerry knows, Eddie Mansfield came in and nearly killed Los Angeles. That's all another show there. All the stories out of that one. Uh, uh, and they tried to, to have him do all the stuff. What, what Piper was doing was like nearly everything in LA. He's wrestling as a heel. He's managing a whole stable of wrestlers, including Keith Franks, who'd later go on to be Adrian Adonis. They were like best friends from Canada days. Uh, managing a ton of guys, including Lonnie Main, who died when he was trying to make that difficult long drive on the five freeway from LA after he appears on a Friday night main event Olympic auditorium with Roddy Piper, tag team, their heels. But then he's going up to battle Roddy in San Francisco as a baby face against a heel. Roddy dies in the, the car accident on the five and, um, you know, major loss for Piper. But Piper also in LA was doing the heel ref thing that he borrowed from his trips down to Salvador Luteras, CMLL, EMLL, the world's oldest promotion in Mexico City. He saw this heel ref thing, so he starts doing that. So he's wrestling, he's heel managing, he's heel refereeing, you know, doing all the stuff we've seen in more modern days with, with a heel ref. Uh, and, and you know, Gene LaBelle got him his uh, New Japan gig and uh, where he had to make a record similar to the Jerry Lawler and Terry Funk albums over there. Roddy released a record, if you recall. How was it? He only it? had one tour. Not good. That's I think what Terry, I was going to say. I think Terry did. Funks and Jerry Lawler's kind of set the standard before WWF had the, the two fantastic LPs of the 80s, and 84 and 85. Jerry, were you ever on an album? You and your, you and your brother Jack didn't sing uh, country music from Oklahoma? Hey, I know my limit, man. <laughs> and singing's not one of them. <laughs> Who, there was some other Unless was, I've had a case of Bud Light. That no, we had, a, we had a guy that was, uh, he wrestled for all of our territories, San Francisco, but por mainly for Don Owen in, in Portland, Beauregard. He released quite a few country oh, yeah. albums. Yeah, he, did, yeah, he was yeah. a good singer. And this is, we're talking 1969 to 73. Yeah, yeah he no, had, Road, Dog, Road Dog is a great singer. You know, always, oh, yeah. there's, been, there's been guys with, a lot less talent than him that have sold millions of copies of records. You know, he just, no, for some reason, no he just never, you know, he is, a, and he's a great entertainer, obviously. 
let me tell you this one. I, I wrote this down. This was when I had that brain fart, the senior brain fart, uh -huh. is two things that Shire did. Uh, Roy Shire was a genius, but again, a yeller, screamer. But he um, got pissed at Buddy Rose and, and said, you're not wrestling tonight. And uh, he took the strap off Buddy, or they, they claimed that to the fans and all that stuff. They were going to have a tournament. So Buddy's told to leave. And he does, but he comes back unbeknownst to Shire and he gets on the house mic. He comes in, I'm making this short. It was much longer than this. He gets on the house mark and he just shoots on Roy Shire. Shitty, dishonest promoter. Da 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 before he was escorted out. And Roy Shire got in trouble. You know, these territories died a long, slow death. There was cable TV. They can't blame Vince. You know, a lot of them blame Vince, but cable TV was really the death of the territories. But Shire, uh, Something happened with him and Mr. Fuji. I don't know if he got shorted on his money. And Fuji was the U.S. champion in a long feud with Don Morocco as lead babyface. So Fuji doesn't show up the night of the show and or the day of the show, you know, when the, the guys would get there at like two o'clock, three o'clock for the booking meetings and all of that stuff. So Shires makes a frantic call to our Art Williams in the office of Michael Bell, L.A. We sent up Toru Tanaka, who was working for us. They were partners for Vince Sr., you know, for a jillion years, one of the greatest tag teams of the 70s, Tanaka and Fuji. But so Tanaka sent up, Roy Shire says, let's put a mask on you and they'll think you're Fuji. And he sends him out there to defend Fuji's title. The commission had a shit fit. Roy was nearly <laughs> stripped. It was a major, major mess. He nearly, and this was like 76, 77. Roy nearly lost it over that. And the commission got mad because Buddy Rose was using foul language over the house mic in front of kids and all that stuff. Totally wow. separate incident. So not shoots, but, or excuse me, not ribs, but still things that are memorable in wrestling history. And they happen in, on the West Coast. You so, know, similar to the Elton Owen ribs. Don Owen, before I forget, Don Owen's brother, who was kind of like a Mark Elton Owen. Yeah, although, Elton, Elton Owen's famous for the shoot. shoot yeah, he would pay, he'd pay these guys and they would say, well, let, we're going to just work it, be easy on ourselves, yeah. but Elton <laughs> will think it's a shoot and we can take his money. And they fooled him every single time for years. Yeah, that's amazing <laughs> fooling him every single time. <laughs> it's I've never heard of that. He was anyway. right at ringside because they say he would sit right at ringside with his arms on the apron and watch it and he's watching guys work. <laughs> and, he's, and he's that... Not but he's paying them to shoot. This is in front of the fans. This ain't in front of the fans. The fans aren't there. He's paying because he wants to see a shoot, but the boys are smart enough to, you know, they don't want to hurt themselves or pop a joint or something. So they talk over the match before, unbeknownst to Elton. And <laughs> they work right. that guy out of thousands of bucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Mike, we want to really thank you for coming on. We covered a lot. We kind of flip-flopped around. But I also want to recognize organization that you're the lead photographer and that's the cauliflower alley club that does tremendous things for talent both john and i had friends that, that they've helped out and uh, we really appreciate it and, uh, what a wonderful organization that, that that you your your lead photographer we're coming on 55 years you know uh, wow. even though he co-founded with others iron mike mazurki there's a guy you should look at one of the largest IMDb's. I met, I met R. Mike, my very first TV I ever made in Oklahoma City. He's a good, good friend with Leroy McGurk, and uh, he was guest on Leroy at, at our TV at, at, channel, at Old Channel 4 TV station. My very first TV I ever made, Mike Mazurk was there, and he complimented me. I guess Leroy had told him, you know, we're both Oklahoma State guys, and and Mike, Mike complimented me, and I was the biggest compliment up to that point I'd ever had. <laughs> well, Mike being a great wrestler, but had huge movie and TV. He was right. all over everything in movies. Like H.B. Haggerty, another L.A. guy who was yeah. in a zillion movies like Paint Your Wagon and all of that stuff emanating out of SoCal. But they were like the lifeblood of CAC at the very beginning, particularly Mike, but also hard-boiled Haggerty, who was a Vern Gagne trained, and I think broke him into the biz. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wonderful. I love the territories. I know people say, oh, ECW and Smoky Mountain. Well, they were great. Fantastic, but the real territories on up till about 83, you know, the last standouts were Jared and Don Owen, the last holdouts before they gave it in. But I think of them every day, but I still have to cover everything today. Today's wrestling so athletic and incredible. You wouldn't have like Johnny Valentine putting the headlock on the Missouri Mauler for 10 minutes and absolutely <laughs> getting the crowd involved. That wouldn't, you know, uh, uh, an on the mat headlock 
but it entertained the crowd at just different times and uh, different time, different time. But, but I, we love those times back then, man. That we was love it. They, they, that, that's us. That's what we. That's what. That's, that's where our passion for the business. That's where our love for the business come from. Is seeing those guys in those headlocks for ten minutes. But man, what what a great job CAC does. Would love to get you up there in the organization up in uh, Waterloo, Iowa, the Gay Gable Museum. Here. I went there uh, when uh, Mike Chapman opened the place up to, originally, but yeah, twenty. This is this is our twenty fifth anniversary, so uh, you know you're welcome to come up, come on up and see us, July 18, 19, 20. Well, I hope you guys will have me back. I I I emailed you when I saw you talk about Montreal. I go, you guys have to have me on to talk about the Bashans versus Rougeos, one of the biggest territory wars ever in the biz similar to Sheik versus Bruiser, but again, wealth of talent, everybody was going and working. You either work for one, the Bashans, or you work for the Rougeau's La Lude international promotion up there. But wrestling has so much fantastic history. I hope people delve into it because it's just absolutely incredible. Wonderful, like, 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 Pat, like Pat Latard said, uh, you know, that our head, or I guess, uh, maybe I'll guess that our history is so hidden, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it it was you know the guys wouldn't talk about it for so long and then the guys like the historians come along like you and Mike Chapman we mentioned earlier and, and Gats and a lot of these other guys that really really help bring our history out and it, it's a lost hidden history. There's a lot of movies in our history. <laughs> you know, I want to talk to you about Andy Gunkel trying to what balls trying to take on. It was a futile attempt but yeah, she yeah. was drawn good against the the whole nwa atlanta and tell, and tell your buddy tom ernesto yeah oh no no that <laughs> trojan horse before i go i have to say long live danny hodge i oh, miss yeah. danny hodge so much wasn't he a lot of fun to be around uh, always 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 yeah always well, Doc, thank you very much the one i got to go say my stay